investigation, along with the Southwest Florida Reset Center, are working with some of the elders to develop deeper relations with them so we might help work for their sovereignty and many other issues as we are learning to be good neighbors. We are living a living spiritual beloved community and we are here to be open to our deepest personal selves that we may also help transform the systems of our society to bring peace with all of Creator's sacred manifestations so that we might know true peace and belonging within ourselves, with our families and communities, and for the benefit of all future generations of all species. Let us now join in continuing this transformational, heart-centered wisdom quest as we begin our morning service. Call to worship is entitled Thresholds, Liminal Spaces. We cross them every day, from room to room, from outside to inside and back again, from here to there, from anywhere to <coughs> everywhere, and from age to age. Each threshold offers an opportunity for change, for renewal, for transformation from what we were and what we are to what we can be. In this hour and in this place, we cross a threshold from our day-to-day -day everydayness into space and time attuned to the other, to the sacred, to the holy, into an awareness of new life pregnant with possibilities. How will we be renewed in this moment? How will we be changed in this hour? And how will we be transformed through this gathering of beloved community? Come, you longing, thirsty souls, come, let us worship together. Good morning. Please rise in body or spirit for the chalice lighting, followed by our covenant and our opening hymn. Today, on Indigenous Peoples Day and during LGBTQ plus History Month and National Hispanic Heritage Month, we light our chalice for all the marginalized among us. May this flame shine a light on the indignity, the erasure, and the terror that has perpetuated through the centuries. May we use the energy of this flame to speak out against injustices here and wherever we find them. Please join me in our covenant. Love is the spirit of this congregation and service its law. This is our great co covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. Our opening hymn is number 163 for the earth forever turning.
The story for all ages is Sky Woman Falling. This is a story that is told by many, many indigenous um, people of our United States and Canada. But this particular one is from Braiding Sweetgrass from Wall, excuse me, Robin Wall Kim Kimmer. -er. In the beginning, there was the sky world. She fell like a maple seed pirouetting in the autumn breeze. A column of light streamed from a hole in the, in the sky world, marking her path where only darkness had been before. It took her a long time to fall. In fear, or maybe hope, she clutched a bundle tightly in her hand. Hurtling down, she saw only dark water below. But in that emptiness were many eyes gazing up at the sudden shaft of light. They saw there a small object, a mere dust mode in the beam. As it grew closer, they could see it was a woman, arms outstretched, long black hair billowing behind as she spiraled towards them. The geese nodded at one another and rose together from the water in a wave of goose music. She felt the beat of their wings as they flew beneath to break her fall far from the only home she had ever known. She caught her breath at the warm embrace of soft feathers as they gently carried her downward. And so it began. The geese could not hold the woman above the water for much longer. So they called a council to decide what to do. Resting on their wings, she saw them all gather Loons, otters, swans, beavers, fish of all kinds. A great turtle floated in their mist and offered his back for her to rest upon. Gratefully, she stepped from the goose wings onto the dome of the shell. The others understood she needed land for her home and discussed how they might serve her need. The deep divers among them had heard of mud at the bottom of the water and agreed to go find some. Loon dove first, but the distance was too far and after a long while, he surfaced with nothing to show for her, his efforts. One by one, the other animals offered to help. Otter, beaver, sturgeon, but the depth the darkness and the pressures were too great for even the strongest swimmers. They returned gasping for air with their heads ringing. Some did not return at all. Soon, only one little muskrat was left, the weakest diver of all. He volunteered to go while the others looked on doubtfully. His small legs fla failed, flailed as he worked his way downward and he was gone a very long time. They waited and waited for him to return, fearing the worst of their relative. And before long, a stream of bubbles rose with the small, limp body of the muskrat. He had given his life to aid this helpless woman. But then the others noticed that his paw was tightly clenched. And when they opened it, there was a small handful of mud. Turtle said, here, put it on my back and I will hold it. Sky Woman bent and spread the mud with her hands across the shell of the turtle. Moved by the extraordinary gifts of the animals, she sang in thanksgiving and then began to dance, her feet caressing the earth. 
The land grew and grew as she danced their, her thanks from the dab of mud on turtle's back until the whole earth was made, not by Sky Woman alone, but from the alchemy of all the animals' gifts coupled with her deep gratitude. Together, they formed what we know today as Turtle Island, our home. Like any good guest, Sky Woman had not come empty-handed. The bundle was still clutched in her hand. When she toppled from the hole in the sky world, she had reached out to grab, grab onto the tree of life that grew there. In her grasp were branches, fruits, and seeds of all kinds of plants. These she scattered onto the new ground and carefully tended each one until the world turned from brown to green. Sunlight streamed through the hole from the sky world, allowing seeds to flourish. Wild grasses, flowers, seeds, and medicines spread everywhere. And now that the animals too had plenty to eat, many came to live with her on Turtle Island. Now, if you would um, like to close your eyes and center yourselves as I read, Teach Us to Remember Our History by Judy Geiger. Spirit of life, God of many names, source of hope, we come together at the end of another week, some worn down by struggles of health, of home, or work. May we be a community that makes space for the sharing of joys and sorrows, angers and hopes, with grace and forbearance. In our nation's life, we pause this holiday weekend to remember the natives, lives lost from the European colonization on what we what is now considered our so soil. Teach us to remember our history. Though we cannot make amends for what has come before, may we learn from those ways never to repeat them in our lives today. May we develop new ways of relating to neighbor and stranger without violence or coercion, deceit or greed. Mother of Grace, help us find a sense of humility where we have privilege and strength where we face oppression. And in our struggles, may we learn compassion and in our power, may we learn temperance. As a community of faith, May we be a safe harbor in a world that is often harsh and towards difference. Challenge us to use our presence as a healing force for justice and equity. Knowing that although we have come far in the civil rights struggles of our times, there are many people still left behind. And the work of building the beloved community is just as pressing as ever before. Let us pause for a moment of silence. Amen. Thank you, Leslie, for that incredible centering. Our Stones of Intention ceremony is a time when we reflect on significant events noted in our time of centering and in our personal lives 
and in the lives of this congregation, as well as more broadly in all areas of the world where conflict has tragically led to violence. May they, may we, discover new ways of viewing our differences, uplifting creative alternatives to violence. Today, we celebrate the LGBTQ community, Hispanic and indigenous people from around the world. There are many within this community who are experiencing various levels of loss, trauma, I might say, illness and concerns. You are surrounded by love and caring. If there is any way that we can be of assistance and service to you, please reach out to Reverend Sue or to members of our pastoral care committee that we might be of service to you and help. I am one of the members of that committee, so if you have things, I can see you after the service. Please fill out a connection card that we might be able to help you in any possible way. In addition, if you have concern about anybody else in the congregation um, that you think that we should know about, please share that on a connection card as well. So whether you are here for the very first time or have been here for many, many times, I invite you to come forward during the music that will follow here to offer a stone of intention. If you did not pick up a stone in the narthex, you may pick one up here from the baskets on the chancel. As you cradle the stone in your hands, you may ask it to symbolize and hold your intentions, your reflections, your prayers, or a joy, or a sorrow, or a milestone in your life. And as you place the stone in the sand, it will join all the others offered by the people here who are doing this, and with, offered with their intentions and prayers, and be surrounded by the love and peace that is brought forward. Please now come forward for your sharing at this time.
intentions be heard and your hearts restored. Let us join in singing hymn number 207, Earth Was Given as a Garden. My reflection this morning is entitled, From Othering to Belonging. And we are doing this in honor of the Presidential Proclamation for Indigenous Peoples Day, which was offered in October of 2021. Efforts to change from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day, or some varied version of that phrase, like Native American Day or other, started back in the 70s. And actually, in, a number of things happened along the way. And there was actually a, a plan from the federal government to have three ships, replicas of the ships of Columbus, sail under the Golden Gate Bridge and celebrate the, the wonderful things that Columbus did for America. That got canceled because of the protestations of various people along the way. But I want to share with you a statement from the National Museum of the American Indian on the National Mall. It's called Unlearning Columbus Day Myths celebrating Indigenous Peoples Days. Many students learned the phrase, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? But Columbus was not the first foreign explorer to land in the Americas, as we all know. Neither he nor those that came before him discovered America, because indigenous peoples have populated the Western Hemisphere for tens of thousands of years. European contact resulted in devastating loss of life, disruption of tradition, and enormous loss of lands for indigenous peoples in the Americas. It is estimated that in the 130 years following first contact, 
Native America lost 95% of its population. Indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere immediately experienced enslavement and theft of resources by the explorers turned settlers. Colonies created by the Portuguese, Spanish, as well as the French, Dutch, and English grew throughout the Americas and increasingly encroached upon nature and native lives and lands. Warfare, enslavement, excuse me, warfare, enslavement, and forced relocation disrupted and altered the lives of the indigenous peoples in the Americas, North and South. Celebrating Columbus and other explorers like him dismisses the devastating losses experienced by indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere in the past and the ongoing effects of colonialism today. We'll get to that in just a moment. Indigenous people are here, still here. Contemporary Native Americans have led numerous movements to advocate for their own rights. Native people continue to fight to maintain the integrity and viability of indigenous societies. American Indian history is one of the cultural persistence, creative adapt adaptation, renewal, and resilience. Native peoples, students, and allies are responsible for official celebrations of Indigenous Peoples Day in many states. Indigenous people, which recognizes the resilience and diversity of Indigenous people in the United States. I'm sorry for the confusion there. But why are we changing? And what is it that, that brought Columbus to do these kinds of things and brought about these terrible things? It was the doctrine of discovery. The doctrine of discovery was three papal bulls that were written between 1450, in the 1450s up to 1493, the year after Columbus came to the Americas. And the impact of the doctrine of discovery on the indigenous nations of Turtle Island is here called unsettling truths. The collective expression of the papal bulls that would result in the doctrine of discovery fueled the conquest of non-European lands by Europeans. As Stephen Newcomb notes, what is generally referred to as the doctrine of discovery might be more accurately called the doctrine of Christian European arrival, or better still, the doctrine of Christian European invasion. The doctrine of discovery served a dual function, a theological doctrine that served as an affirmation from the church for European atrocity and political, even military doctrine that provided political boundaries and mediation between colonial settler powers. The doctrine as discovered, expressed in Portugal furthered the African slave trade and as expressed to Spain, affirmed the discovery of Americas. At the foundation of this doctrine was a narrative of European Christian purity and supremacy that negated the value and worth of the other and permitted European Christians to assume their own supremacy and privilege on specious theological grounds. The doctrine encoded racial ideas that created a hierarchy within humanity that invariably placed European Christian nations in the position of power and the assumption of white supremacy took root in the imagination of the Western mind. But what was that European mindset? It came from the whole issue of power between the papacy and the royalty. But behind that even was the whole concept of othering. Now, othering is relatively new term to me, 
I learned of it through some of the Pachamama work that I've done and from Reverend Deborah Johnson who uh, is on the board of Pachamama and does some of the programs for them. The process of othering can be divided into two steps. It's categorizing a group of people according to perceived differences such as ethnicity, skin color, religion, gender, or sexual orientation then identifying that group as inferior and using an us versus them mentality to alienate the group. I have often said in the work that I've done that one of the great tasks that we have as we age is to expand the group of we and us to include those that we have been othering for most of our lives. But othering is also used as a way of separating ourselves from the rest of nature, permitting us to kill, use, or profit from, or destroy whatever we deem expendable, no matter the cost or damage to anyone or anything else. From a language perspective, what it means is that everything becomes an object instead of a subject. And if you call something an object, think of it as an object, it has the kind of status that allows you to do just about anything to it you wish to. And elements arising out of othering are things that we've already heard happened to the American and uh, indigenous people of North and South America, slavery. We are living in the most critical time in hu human history. We today are living in the most critical time of human history. We are living with an unsustainable mindset, an unsustainable economic system, and in short, an unsustainable relationship with Mother Earth. And I wonder, what if the Europeans had taken a different tack when they arrived on, a, on this land? If they had slowed down enough to appreciate the indigenous lived experience, their thousands of years of living in harmony with Mother Nature, their knowledge of the natural world, life and seasonal cycles, plants as medicine, and shared the strength of their community. Most everyone that I read and most everyone I talk with shares the same perspective. We are not going to be saved in our environmental crisis by electric cars, solar panels or windmills, planting trees, recycling or whatever. We can only be saved by a change of heart, which is the only path living in harmony with Mother Earth. She has continually showered her gifts on us she has provided everything we need in great abundance. And it's now time for us to return the gift and care for her. This year, I celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day with a whole new perspective of wonder and appreciation for the wisdom of their heritage and relationships that are incorporated into their living traditions. Of all the reading I've done with incredibly wonderful discussions with my book group partners and others, we've read from indigenous sources, including the, the Good Neighbor Program of Reset, and the curriculum, uh, the American Indian, Toltec wisdom, Andean wisdom, Celtic wisdom from Ireland and Scotland and other wisdom teachers from around the world. And I've chosen 
just two to illustrate some of the teachings of these incredible authors to represent our indigenous relatives. The first is Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul by John Philip Newell. It is Celtic wisdom for reawakening to what our souls know in healing the world. This first statement is from the introduction. I quote, we know things in the core of our being that have not necessarily been taught. And some of this deep knowing may actually be at odds with our society or religion has tried to teach us. This book is about reawakening to what we know in the depths of our being, that the earth is sacred and this sacredness is at the heart of every human being and life form. To awaken again to this deep knowing is to be transformed in the ways we choose to live and relate and act. What is unique about the Celtic tradition is that at its core is the conviction that we essentially need to keep listening to what our own soul already knows. We're born with it. We can, however, be part of new beginnings. This touches me so much. We can, however, be part of new beginnings. We can open ourselves to a radical humility of heart, which is our true strength, and look with expectation for the sacred deep within the other. He's not othering by using that word, by the way. The other individual, the other religion, the other race or na nation or sexual orientation. And we can look with reverence to serve this sacredness in the other, to honor it, to nurture it, and to come into true relationship with it, allowing it further to reawaken in us the sacredness at the heart of our own being as well. What's deep in my soul resonates totally with what John Philip Newell has shared from Celtic wisdom. The second quoting that I have is again from Braiding Sweetgrass. And I know that some of you here have read Braiding Sweetgrass and some are reading Braiding Sweetgrass. It is one of the best books I have read in all of my years. Listen to the sensitivity. Oh, it's by Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is a Potawatomi uh, of the Potawatomi Nation. And she, she's a professor uh, of botany. And so she brings scientific and the, and the indigenous wisdom and blends them together in such beautiful, beautiful ways. Listen to the sensitivity of her language, speaking with great affection and delight at seeing the sweet grass she has planted over the years. She says, and I quote, it stops you, calls you to slow down and see the meadow with new eyes. Look what was waiting for you. All you needed to do was pay attention. Dropping to your knees, you can't help but sigh in recognition of the gift that was there all along. I'm awash with gratitude. I'm profoundly grateful for the privilege of carrying a message from the plants so that they can do their work. I wrote Braiding Sweetgrass from the belief that since plants are medicine, so too could their stories be healing. A great longing is upon us to live again in a world made of gifts. 
I wrote Braiding Sweetgrass in response to longing in indigenous communities that our philosophy and practices be recognized as guidance to set us back on the path of life. I wrote in response to longing from colonizers beset with the aftermath of injustice and living on stolen land to find a path of belonging. I heard lo longing from the trampled earth herself to be loved and honored again. Longing from sandhill cranes and wood thrushes and wild irises just to live. I wrote from a sense of reciprocity. I hoped always to inspire an authentic revitalization of relationship with the land. Plant blindness impedes the recognition of the green world as a garden of gifts. The cycle flows from attention to gift to gratitude to reciprocity, but it starts with seeing. In this time of transformation, she says, when creation and destruction wrestle like sky woman's mythic grandsons gambling with the future of the earth, what would it take for us to follow sky woman, to jump to the new world, to co-create it, all of us together, what does it take to abandon what does not work and take the risks of uncertainty? We need courage. We need each other's hands to hold it, and faith in the geese to catch us. It would help us to sing. The landing might not be soft, but land holds many medicines. Propelled by love, ready to work, we can jump together in the world we want to co-create with hands full and pockets full of seeds and rhizomes for sweet grass. I believe that this is so touching and so impactful and so wise. I believe these readings represent a portion of indigenous wisdom that if followed, if we actually lived it, can be the salvation of mankind in these really critical times. And when we are sacred, we cannot other each other, but we can love each other. I'm going to finish with a short portion of a poem called Hieroglyphic Stairway by Drew Dellinger. It's three 23 in the morning, and I'm awake because my great-great-grandchildren won't let me sleep. My great-great-grandchildren ask me in dreams, what did you do while the planet was plundered? What did you do when the earth was unraveling? Surely you did something when the season started failing. As the mammals, reptiles, birds were all dying, did you fill the streets with protest? When democracy was stolen, they say, what did you do once you knew? Let us begin again and again, right here in this incredible UUCFM community to embody every one of our great dreams for our now, as well as for all future generations, that we might all experience the joy of truly belonging in every possible manner here and all over our great mother earth, Pachamama. So be it, and amen. So I understand my voice is disembodied, but believe me, I'm still with you. We give to remind ourselves how many gifts we have to offer. 
We give to remember that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. We give because we believe in music and sacred space. We give that the faith together we have enough. Our community sharing partner in October is Planned Parenthood of Southwest and Central Florida. Their mission is to provide affordable access to comprehensive sexual and reproductive health care and accurate health information through patient care, education, and advocacy. These services are provided to women, men, and teens throughout the Southwest and Central Florida. All loose money will go to the community sharing recipient. If you're, you would like for your offering to go to UUCFM, please designate that on the offering envelope found at the welcome table. Or on Zoom, click the link in the chat box to designate UUCFM and or our community sharing partner. If you are a guest, please place your connection card in the bag. The morning offering will now be generously giving and gratefully received.
Please rise in body or spirit as we recite the words of gratitude, followed by the extinguishing of the chalice. By the work of our hands and the work of our hearts, our love is made real. May we be grateful for all that is given and grateful for all that is shared. <clears throat> We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. May we all be caught up in the sacred spirit of creating the world of belonging that our hearts know is possible. May the light of our inner being shine brightly in our every interaction. <clears throat> and may the spirit of love surround you wherever you go. Go now in peace for all our relations. Amen. We're so grateful that you joined us today. After the worship team exits the sanctuary, please greet your neighbor, then join others in Hobart Hall for refreshments and conversation. If you're on Zoom, please stay on to join me for connection and conversation with each other. We look forward to seeing you all again next Sunday. Hello, Leslie. Hello, Kat. I want to tell you how much I loved your opening words. Your choice of story. Everything that you said. Thank you so, so much. You're welcome. And um, I wish my uh, video was working, but I don't know what happened to it. But um, I'm glad that you could hear my words because, of course, that's the most important part of the service is, is the words. Your, your video did still work at that point. Yes. Yeah, you didn't lose I, it until afterward. Yeah, I don't know where it went. I tried to fix 